Hello, this is Mike again from Scratch, and welcome to our ongoing game development for complete beginners tutorial series. Today we are looking at Lua functions. Now, functions are a critical part of programming. Almost any programming language is, is built around the concept of functions. And functions are simply reusable code. A very handy way of organizing your code into different discrete blocks, uh, as we will see. So let's jump right into our code now. And you will see we've been calling functions nonstop. Here is the, what we've been doing a lot. That is a function call. We are calling the function print. And today what we're going to do is go ahead and create our own functions, our own little bits of reusable code. So let's go and create one that does this for us, that prints hello world for us. Not really useful, but it's an easy one to demonstrate. Now to declare a function, remember earlier I said Lua has reserved words, special words or keywords that are the fundamentals of the language. Well, Function is exactly one of those words. It's how you mark a block of code as being a function. And it goes function and then the name of the function. So we're gonna call this one print hello world. Now functions follow the same naming conventions as variables. That means they can start, excuse me, they can start with an underscore, they can contain a number but can't start with it. Otherwise stick to upper and lower case um, uh, characters um, and you're good to go. And so there is a function. Now you define the body of a function or sorry, the parameters of a function using braces like this, the parentheses. So in my editor automatically put in end. We'll get to that in a second. So the form of a function is you use the function keyword to say, I'm about to declare a function. Sorry about that. So I'm about to declare a function and then the name of the function and then finally, you mark the parameters of the function using parentheses, but we don't have any parameters. And you'll notice it automatically put in this end block. Um, and that's key. This makes this block of code end. So what we have is the code starts here and ends here. So our body of code goes inside of the function right here. Now you'll notice it automatically tabbed in. You don't have to do that, but that is convention to leave a couple of tabs for every level of um, scope or blocking you tend to tab in. Now, if you're from another language, you're probably used to the same thing happening, uh, but like this, using squirrely or brace brackets. That is the way that C++, JavaScript, C, uh, etc. all work. So this end statement is the same thing as the brackets that you use in other programming languages. And so the function starts here and ends here. Now let's do a very simple function here. We'll just do the print hello world. So, so there we just created a function. And now you can call your function just like we called print earlier. So you just call it like, oops, sorry, print hello world like that. And I will save this. We will go over and run our code. And there you see, hello world. And the nice thing about a function is you now have reusable code. So we could sit here and call this wherever, whenever, and however many times we wish, and it will repeat. So it's a way of organizing your code that it's recyclable, reusable, um, and it's a very powerful but simple concept. Now let's look at um, a return value out. And this is important. Remember we looked at variables last time? Well, you can assign a variable returns from a function. So for example, we'll call this function instead. So a new function called get hello, like so. And again, we got their end. So the function goes from here to here. And that's gonna be very important in a moment when I talk about scope. So keep that in mind, that beginning and end, very critical. So now what we're gonna do, instead of printing hello world, we're gonna return the value hello world. So this will return an unnamed variable from our function. So now we can call it like this. Okay, so this is gonna return the value hello world in text, the string hello world, and it's going to be assigned to the variable message to print. So now we can go ahead and go like so, and predictably enough, hello world again. 
So that is returning a value out of a function. Now, Lua is a little strange in what it can do um, is that it can return multiple values from a function. If you come from C or JavaScript or uh, Java or C Sharp or just about every other program not named Python, this is odd behavior we're about to see, but you can actually return multiple values from a function, which can be very, very useful. So we're gonna create a new value called get values. These are all very contrived examples, by the way. But what we're gonna do now is return two values out of this. Return one and two. So we're returning the number value one and the value two. So on your other hand, you now need to accept these values and that can be done like this. So the first value is returned back um, so this value will go into this one. This value will go into this one. And I'll go ahead and show you this. Oops, I didn't actually do anything with it. Okay, so we're actually gonna print our values out this time. And there you see the end result. Now, if you return a value that doesn't exist or you ask for a value um, that was never returned, that's where our magical nil value comes in. So let me show you something else here. So value three. Now you notice we're actually only returning two values here. So now we can go value three and it prints out that magic value of nil. And nil again is nothing. And that's how you check to see that your return type actually returns something. It's a very useful um, little stand in value. Now, another thing that's of interest here is we could also ignore all the results. So we can take just the first value if we wish, like so. Oh, it didn't print it. like that. There's one other topic for dealing with functions that I'm going to just mention now, but we'll get back to it later on because you're going to need to understand tables to take advantage of this. But you can also have multiple arguments to a function that are unnamed. So you can have anonymous arguments to a function. And this is done by basically declaring your function as uh, function with multiple args. And then you just go with dot, dot, dot like that. And this allows you to basically loop through a bunch of functions uh, that are provided in a table that's called arg. However, uh, in order to understand this concept, we're going to have to have understood tables, which I'm going to get to shortly in the future. Now, I'm going to give you a really quick demonstration of how this works. Actually, no, I'm not, because you're going to also have to understand loops, which we haven't covered yet. So there's no point in going to, into this particular topic further. However, just know for now, with functions, there is also the possibility of passing in um, dot, 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 and then having as many parameters as you need. So you don't need to define all your parameters. You can have a variable number of parameters. You can get around that using a table. There's also a way to pass in named arguments. That is, you instead of passing them in an order, which is how all of these other functions have depended, you have to pass the parameters in, in the order that they're required or um, specified, especially when we're looking at them using um, indexes, uh, never mind, ignore that. Uh, but there are ways to actually pass them in using a table by name. But again, we need to understand tables and we need to understand loops to get that concept. So just know for now, you can pass in multiple arguments using this format as well. And we'll get back to why very soon in the short future. Okay, so that's it for functions for now. They're very kind of a simple concept. You mark it as a function. The block ends with the end statement. Uh, the parentheses is where you pass in the parameters. The number of parameters you have is um, up to you. You can pass in variable number of parameters using dot, 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 which we will see later on. And that's about functions. So they're very powerful and pretty easy to understand. Now, the last thing I wanna talk about here is scope. Now, remember all these times where I've said, put local. That local is an important word. Well, local is saying scope. And this is kind of a tricky concept to wrap your head around. So hopefully I can make sense of it for you. So let's say we have a variable called meaning of life and its value is 24 because I'm mildly dyslexic. Okay. So on the outside, we have this value called meaning of life. And now we say we have a function called, um, 
calculate meaning of life. And it took no parameters like so. Now here is again why using tabs makes sense because it's a good way of marking scope or blocks of code. Now this here is a block, but then again, so is this. Okay, so when your entire script by default is in a block, it's they're all at the same level, and then this is kind of creating a sub block within it. And I'm going to show you why this gets important right here. So I'm making another variable called like this, okay? So now we have two variables with the same name. And this is okay, you can actually do this. And if they're in the same scope or if they were at the same level, they were just right over top of each other, not a really big deal. But in this case, which one is going to run? Well, the version in this scope this is what local means. It means local to the scope you're in. And as I said earlier, this defines a scope. So this variable will exist from this point on and take precedence. But at this point, it dies. Okay, so this variable being called local only lasts to the end of its scope. Same way as this guy being local only lasts to the end of this file being run. And that's very important when you start getting into more and more complex code. All right, so totally makes sense if you use the word local. Now, if you take the word local out, oh, I guess I should actually run this so you can see the result. Oops. Uh, Lua, oh, wait, 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 Lua52 main.lua. Oh, duh. Helps to actually calculate, to call your function. So we're calling that function now and it is printing the value of 42, okay? It's very key to understand what just happened there. Now, where it gets confusing though, is if I take this local out, okay? So now this is not a local variable, it's a global variable. Now, global variables are available everywhere. So I could actually take this line of code out right here, and since we have this global variable, this will just go ahead and work. So this will print 24 now which is very cool in a way, but it gets very confusing when I put, so I'm gonna put this guy back in. Okay, so we now have the local defined and the global. So the local takes precedence. The local will overwrite the global version, but this gets confusing if you have a function that's doing something like this. So we're overwriting it. So at this level, the value is 24. This level, we overwrote it. And if we get back out to here, These are both going to be, oh, they're gonna be different actually, which is exactly what you want, because here, what did I do wrong there? Oh, it's 24 out here, yeah, so that makes sense. So it's actually clobbering it, and there is where globals come in and get kind of scary. You can create very, very, very messy code by having these variables that, especially once you start dealing with them, they're in other files completely, and they're in other places, so this is why local is so important. When you mark a variable, if it's only going to exist, so if this variable is only meant to live inside of this function, throw that word local in front of it. And then even if you have another variable by the same name, it doesn't matter. They're not going to clobber each other. They're not going to overwrite each other. They're going to play well together and everything is wonderful. So that is where local comes in and that's where scope comes in. Now we're going to see scope quite a few more times. This is scope at a function level and this is scope at a file level. Uh, but there's also going to be scope inside of um, loops, etc. So scopes come up again and again. Basically whenever you have an end tag like this. That end tag is talking about the end of a scope. Now in that case, it's the end of this function's scope. Okay, so hopefully that made sense. If it doesn't, let me know in the comments and I will do a much probably clearer example. I went a little bit off the rails in my demonstration there and I could have probably done a bit better. So if I did not, if I did not explain scope well enough, just for now, keep using local whenever it makes sense to use local. You probably don't want a global most of the times. And global variables can really quickly lead to some really messy code. Now, don't get me wrong, local global variables can also uh, be very, very handy, uh, but they're easy to abuse and they're easy to create crap. So that's why I say default to local and pretty much every good programmer out there will tell you the same thing, regardless to what language you're using. Okay, so that's it. I uh, hope you, uh, Hope that was useful. I hope it didn't get too confusing at the end there. See y'all soon. Bye.